All right, so share my screen. You got to present this thing. Slideshow in the beginning. There it is. All right, welcome to the Boundaries Workshop, everyone. Thanks again for coming. Um, I know this is a webinar, but I'm really uh, trying to think of this more as a workshop and a place for um, your own reflection on boundaries and a guide to work through how to be setting boundaries in a way that feels good to you um, and doing that through reflection and discussion and assessment. And by the end, hopefully, we'll have some new tools for y'all to use. So let's move on. So I've been, as I've been doing more trainings, I've been thinking more about what it means to come into the space after you've been doing whatever you've been doing with your day, probably something hard. Um, we're all working from home, and that's hard. Um, but to come into the training as a place for you to figure out what you want to get out of it um, and what you need to be fully engaged or present today. Um, so I, I do this thing where I put my phone like underneath a book because if I see my phone, I will like want to look at it. Um, but I, whatever you need to do, you think about it um, and bring yourself into the space. So take a moment, whatever that is. Um, and what I like to do is I like to do a little bit of writing about what's been going on for me today, anything I'm preoccupied with um, that I need to get out so I can focus on what's going on. Um, so I do a little vulnerability practice here. I'm gonna do a little writing for you. You can do writing or you can not do writing. So what I need to do to put aside is some perfectionism about work, about this webinar being the best thing ever, and it's not going to be that. And also some anger about the world right now. So take some time, a minute or so, to do that or not do it. I'm going to go back to the slideshow. People are in the chat. Oh, Eliza says there may be an issue with the link. Hmm. I don't know what to do about that. So <laughs> thanks for letting me know, Eliza. So here's our overview of what we're going to be talking about today with boundaries. We're really going to be talking about a space for reflection, discussion, assessing, and creating some type of tool. And another bringing yourself into the moment space is this is a reflection workshop webinar. So do you have paper? Do you have a pen to write things down? Um, and also a chance for you to think about how do you hold on to information? You know, my coworker Katie Condrat just has papers everywhere and uh, she talks about how it's hard to hold on to things. And I, I like to use a notebook. Um, but I've also been doing, uh, in support groups, making zines for people. Because I just don't like to give out handouts. People put them in folders and never look at them. But when you create something nice and pretty and you want to put it on your desk or something, you might actually look at it more. So I'll show you what that looks like. Here's mine. This is one I made in a support group. Pages. Right on it. All right. So if you do want to make one of those, my next slide shows you how. 
no worries. Whatever works for you, this workshop is about creating tools for you to come back to. Um, if you want to make a zine, that's great. If you want to write them down on a piece of paper, that's great. Open a work, Word document, whatever works for you. This is just an invitation. So actually getting into the content here, this is one of my favorite quotes by a person named Prentice Hemphill. It says, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. Um, I, I like this quote because I think when I first started talking about boundaries, it felt like they were barriers I put up that shouldn't be there. There's like people have needs and I can, you know, respond and give them them, or I can just put up this boundary. Uh, but these boundaries are really about prioritizing me as well. Prioritizing that people need my care and that I also need my care and that I don't have to choose, that I can do them at, at the same time. And so I talk a little bit more about that here. Um, boundaries really about not having to sacrifice my well-being to support someone else. Is that I can prioritize both of those things at the same time. And I think a lot in, in our helping work, we run into this idea of saviorism down here, um, that some people need to be saved and other people need to do the saving. And in doing a saving, you are not prioritizing your own well-being. Um, so boundaries are really a place, I think, for us to, to come back to being, am I leaning into saviorism right now? Or feeling like I have to choose between supporting a survivor and supporting myself? So those are just some things to think about at the top um, as we move on. So when I was first thinking about this webinar, it really made sense to me to go into what a sexual assault advocate actually does. So how are we supposed to know if we've crossed our own boundaries if we don't know what our roles are? Um, when we know what our roles are, we can figure out when we've stepped out of them and bring ourselves back into our definitions of the role. So I did a little bit of research and Leah Green from the Resource, Resource Sharing Project um, held a webinar a little bit a while back. And these are some of the things she said about advocacy and what an advocate does and is. But I wanted to give a little bit of space here if people wanna unmute themselves or also just put in the chat box. Is something missing here? Is something you disagree with or Another way you think about advocacy that's not on here. Give a couple minutes, a couple, yeah, a minute for people to talk in the chat box or unmute yourself. Yeah, what Susan said about believing victims and survivors unconditionally. That's great. I've seen a lot of rhetoric about like beginning by believing. I believe that. Mm. Powering, as Deanna said, yeah. All right, well, let's move on. Thank you for this. Oh, we got one more. Listen, yes, following lead is, is so key. Thank you, Elise. All right, so we're getting into the reflection piece now. Oh, people are here still chatting. Thank you for chatting. Providing some reflecting back of self critique. Cool. So, like I said before, 
a part of this webinar is going to be self-reflection. And so if you could read this slide and think about a time when you pushed your own boundary for a client, a client was asking you to do something and you checked in with yourself and you're like, I know this is <laughs> pushing a boundary and you still did it or a time where you thought about doing it, but you didn't end up doing it. Or when I, when you set a boundary and a client crossed it. And so just take a moment to think about that. If you are writing anything down or in your zine or in your workbook, you could um, write a little bit about that. And I'll give people a moment here. Yeah, Susan, I've, I've heard that one a lot. So I'm, not, I'm sure it, it does not take much time for people to find a memory of this because it happens in our work all the time. So I'm sure you've, you've written it down or you've brought it into your mind, so we'll move on. So what I'm gonna try and do in this webinar is give you my own experience as you are writing about or reflecting on your own um, as a way of modeling the type of reflection and assessment and creating of the tools so you have an idea of where I've been coming from and how I'm thinking about boundaries. Um, and so my own experience with this, I used to do the statewide live answer service at Sarsom for about like two years. Um, and I've many, many times when people wanted to cross boundaries or across my own boundaries. And there's one time in particular with a young person at Long Creek who ended up calling um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about this in the next couple of slides, but they just wanted to talk to me, not about sexual violence, but about a bunch of other traumas they experienced. And they ended up being a frequent caller and a bunch of stuff happened, but let's move on here. So here's the first prompt for you and I will answer it in the next slide, is how did you know that you were, you were crossing a boundary in yourself if you, you know, stepped over that line to support a client or a subscriber or someone? Um, and then also the opposite of like, how did you know when someone was asking you to cross your own boundary? Like what was coming up for you? Were you thinking about your role as an advocate? Were you thinking about this feels outside of my role? Or was it a a feeling or emotion that something you knew something was wrong. So take a second there and then I will move on and share my experience. I have no idea how to time these things, but I hope that's been enough time. So I'm gonna move on and share what was going on for me and um, you can listen and also keep writing if you want to. So when this happened for me, this did not feel like boundary crossing because of how badly I want to help this person. Even if they weren't talking about sexual violence, they shared their trauma with me and I knew they needed help. So. I didn't feel like I was doing anything like wrong at the time or um, and then when I checked in with myself I knew that like if my manager heard about this this was going to be you know outside of my role and not something in my job description um, but again I think I the reasons I crossed it was because I really wanted to help um, and I was 
looking to have an impact, which I'll, I'll talk more later. So we got another reflection question here is, why did you feel pulled to cross your own boundary or give into the ask the client's desire for you to cross the boundary? Um, so for like Susan, the client asking for her phone number, you know, if she did pu feel pulled to do that, what was going on? Why did you feel that way? And I think it's really important for us to, to do a little reflecting on, even if we know it's a boundary, why we still feel pulled to do it, why we might have done it before, um, and that will give us information on what to do next time that happens. So take a moment um, and do some reflection and writing on that if you want, and then I'll move us along. Yeah, I don't know if people are seeing in the chat, but Susan is, is talking about how difficult it is to, to leave a client during a difficult time. Um, to be like, have such intimate knowledge about the terrible things that are going on in their lives. Um, and you're in this job because you care and you want to help this person. So to, to not help them more feels, feels awful. That's, that's very real, Susan. Thanks for sharing that. Right, Claire is talking about who are we to question what they need. I think that's that's one of the, the trickiest things about this work is we, we go into it um, believing survivors and saying, you know what you need. I'm here to help you get there or find the resources. And sometimes what they ask for is things that cross our boundaries or things that we can't do. And that feels awful. Yeah, Eliza, sometimes it feels like I might be the only support person. That one for me, for sure, with this uh, incarcerated person was that if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Um, and sitting with that feeling is awful. Thanks everyone for sharing. I'm gonna move along. So yeah, uh, I think, especially on the helpline, like actually hearing someone's voice and the way that makes your body feel of someone being really desperate and telling you what they need. Um, it's very hard to say no to that because you want to. Um, and I talk a little bit about here how I was looking to have an impact in people's lives. I think that's a big reason why a lot of us get into this work is because we want to help people and that we're met with many circumstances where we can't help people. And so when someone tells us, hey, you're really helpful, or when you're talking to someone and you know you could say a couple things, you know, that might end up being more of like a therapeutic relationship, but you know you have the skills to do it. Um, to not give them those things is really hard. And then I talk a little bit about here about this person not getting what they needed from a therapist. They kept telling me that. They kept telling me they didn't have money to call anybody else, that our line was like one of the only free lines they could call. Um, and then, yeah, sitting with this feeling of if I draw this boundary right now, because I know this is not what I'm supposed to do. I know they're not talking about sexual violence. And if I draw this boundary, I'm going to have to have this intimate knowledge that this person is going to keep struggling, keep feeling awful, and I could have helped. 
and I didn't do it. Um, and so I get to avoid sitting with that feeling by just trying to fix it by saying, yeah, I'll do it. And that lets me not have to sit with that struggle. So oh, we got people in the chat. Slippery slope, for sure. I hope that makes sense. I'm gonna keep going on. More reflection writing prompts. Um, when you're bringing that, that memory, and probably many memories of people pushing your boundaries or you crossing your own boundary, I think getting in contact with the emotions if you're able to um, is really important. How did it feel during? How did it feel after? What can those feelings teach us? So take a second there and feel free to type in the chat if you want. Um, and then I will move this along to how I felt in that situation. All right, I hope people have gotten in touch with those feelings if they wanted to and if they've done a little writing or reflecting on them. This is how I felt. At the beginning, it felt really rewarding um, to be seen as someone who's helpful. Um, and then it got more nerve wracking. More, I had more of an understanding of how much this person was going to start relying on me by calling every day, every other day, asking to speak to me. And at the same time, I felt like I should be able to do that because who else was gonna do it? Um, and this person, you know, like Clara said, had their needs and were asking for them. And who was I to say, your needs aren't valid. And so after that, um, I did end up talking to my manager and things got worse. They ended up talking to other staff when I wasn't there um, and were really angry and frustrated that other staff were <clears throat> holding boundaries with them, that they were not not talking about sexual violence and uh, other staff were saying, we're only here to talk about and so they ended up being really mean and rude to other staff. And they ended up sexually harassing some of my coworkers. And for me, it was like ugh, just a slap in the face of a lesson of that I really was, was trying to help this person. And I set up a situation where the kind of support they got, they couldn't get from other staff. Um, and so, by trying to help and overextending myself, I had really set up this, this terrible situation. Um, well. So I really was hoping folks could talk a little bit about um, if they, felt like this experience rang true for them at all, if they had other, you know, different experiences that didn't really align with what I was talking about. Um, just a popcorn style, feel free to unmute yourself in chat or go in the chat box and I can read them out there. Um, but these, these four questions we had about knowing when a boundary is being crossed because you know your role why people cross boundaries, understanding of that, why we might cross our own, and how it feels in the emotions, and then what the result is when people end up crossing our boundaries or we cross our own. 
Um, and just a little space for discussion and then we'll, we'll keep going there. So feel free to chime in. Yeah, Jess is in the chat talking about um, how she knows when she's crossed the boundary and she feels anxious and avoid talking about what's happening. That's for sure. <laughs> I definitely avoided talking about this with my manager for a while because I, I knew. Uh, and I also really didn't want to stop because I really wanted to help this person. Thanks for sharing that, Jess. Yeah, for sure, that uh-oh feeling. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides. Yeah, this, this piece Susan is, is talking about that. I don't know. My body like gets goosebumps when I read that because I had such similar situations and and again that, that those bodily feelings of what does it mean to to not do that? Stomach butterfly, yeah. All right. Thanks for having that discussion, y'all. Keep moving on. So for me, once we've gone the whole, the gamut of boundaries of crossing them, having to reset them, dealing with the feelings is about this idea of assessment. What do you need? Claire says, we cross boundaries because we or they need something. And if a clear boundary isn't set, it's hard to know when to stop, for sure. So I think this part is about, um, getting in touch with what you need to be able to hold those firm boundaries when you're distressed. Like Susan was talking about of having to know what that child is going home to or any of those, those feelings in your body of like, uh, I know so, so intimately the harm this person is dealing with and yet still I wanna hold this firm boundary. Um, and for me, the blue part is, is the, my reflection piece is that a lot of this is about grief. That I am not making time to sit with my grief. Um, that the way of doing this work distresses me all the time. And that I have to have such knowledge of such harm. And I'm not giving space for me to to sit with that grief and to think about it and to write about it. Um, and I end up feeling like I can't do anything or that I need to do something. Um, and that I think causes the cycle of, of boundary crossing again. Like I, I have to do something now, even if it's crossing a boundary, I need to, to move on. Oh boy, I'm going too fast here. Oh no, okay. So let's go to the chat because people are typing. Mm. Yeah, Casey, that's that's so helpful. Um, the worst they've ever had or the best they've ever had. <laughs> the, when people say the best, oh, it feels so good. And I, I think I, I'm often looking for that feeling. Um, even if I know it's a, it's a danger signal. 
so for me, this, this uh, understanding of grief, it, it makes me need to honor it and give it space. Um, and so for a way I've been navigating boundaries is writing about the grief, talking about with my supervisor and finding ways to find meaning and impact and engagement. Um, and for me, a lot of that was done in support groups. So that, you know, being on the phone, like feeling like I didn't have impact or engagement and then um, wanting it really bad and crossing my own boundaries to get it and making things worse for the client, worse for me, worse for my team. Um, being able to find that in other places of the work that were actually responsible was really important. So here's another moment for you to reflect and write about what you think you need. My thing was really the grief, but what practice of care can you incorporate into your work life when you think about why you cross boundaries or like what really pulls on your heartstrings? How can you take care of yourself? If you're gonna hold firm to that boundary, it's probably gonna feel bad. Um, and what's a practice you can make to process that feeling or make space for that feeling? So if anyone, I'm sure people are already doing this. Um, if they wanna share a practice or if you wanna take a moment and think about what you want your practice to be, you write it down in your book or write it in the chat. We can talk about it. Deanna has a call. Thanks, Deanna. All right, I'm gonna move this along here. I'm gonna try to, there we go. So what I'm hoping to do next, if we remember back at the beginning, that time for reflection, discussion, assessment, and then creation, uh, is to build a tool for yourself, for boundaries. Um, and that's where that little zine is, is really great, but also Word document, your notebook, piece of paper, whatever it is, having a tool for yourself to come back to right after you had a hard boundary conversation before you're going to have to have a hard boundary conversation. Um, I think a lot of our work about boundaries is, is how to take care of ourselves in the follow-up, but also how to better prepare ourselves to have these conversations. So, a lot of the, those uh-oh feelings um, I talk about here are our bodies have, have so much knowledge um, and they wanna share with us a lot of the time and a lot of it comes through sensations. Um, and we tend to know that something is wrong. Um, and so if you've ever had your boundaries crossed before, you probably know what your body feels like. Um, and reminding yourself of what those warning signs are trying to tell you is really important. And then I think this next part about reminding yourself of the limits of your role, of what your job is actually supposed to do. So when you can take this information, your body's telling you one thing, and now you can use more your logic side, say, hey, does this actually fit in my role? And then the next piece, is about addressing some of those fears. You know, like Eliza said about, if I don't help, who is gonna help? Because they, they want your attention. Uh, pushing them down often doesn't work. And the last part uh, is reasons to uphold the boundary. So for me, I think a lot about what harm happens if I don't, you know, because I've had this experience of, of crossing boundaries. Um, and being able to tell yourself, this is why I'm gonna do this, even if it feels really bad, 
I know from my experience, it's going to be worse. Uh, so people are in the chat, so I'm going to read that. <clears throat> Yes, what people are saying about youth is, oh, that's really, that's my button too. Uh, you know, my person was this person in, in Long Creek, uh, who's a young person, but a lot of the other harder calls I've had have been with youth. Um, and before this, working at a group home, setting boundaries there was, was, was terrible too. Um, and, and it just makes sense because these folks are usually very vulnerable um, and don't have a lot of their own agency to, to make things happen and rely on other people. Um, so it's, it's very hard. Clara, that's great. Yeah. Just remind yourself that clear boundaries are, are so helpful. Yes. Yes. I love what Maddie's saying here about setting a boundary is this setting a gift. Oof, that's it's such a, a great reframe when you're feeling so bad and you're feeling like you're you're blocking your like you're blocking this person from getting the care that they need to reframe it as you're giving them a gift even if it feels bad in the moment that's great and I think Whitney was saying something too yeah this piece about how many other systems have failed um, I know personally that um, I really want to interrupt that and be helpful and that I have to remind myself that it's very like individualistic of me to think that I can change these systems by myself and that I'm not responsible for these systems, just solely me, but um, that we can change them, but it's going to have to be a more, more of a together thing than just me doing it, but that, that feels really true to me. So I'm going to walk you through what I did to build my own tool. And I, as a reminder, this is, these are questions here for you to build your own tool on how to help you with setting a boundary. So I think a lot of people really like what Maddie said. If you wrote that down in your notebook of a boundary being a gift and to remind yourself of that in the moment, that's awesome. Just take whatever works for you. All right, I'm gonna move on. Oh my God, I gotta stop using the mouse. That's the thing. Okay. The other part of building this tool <clears throat> for me is actually writing down what you might say. So I know that I try to be articulate as possible, but when I'm in a really distressing situation, I'm not very so. And I had to learn that many times on the helpline. Um, and I think just like anything else, writing it down, practicing it, just like we do in role plays is going to be helpful for you. But again, this is something for you to keep by your desk, for you to keep in your bag, for you to bring yourself back to after a hard call or before you're going to have to have a call and set a boundary with a person. Here's some time for you to write down some phrases some ways you can repeat those things to the next person you have to say. Um, and also, it's a chance for you to be able to show up in the way you want to show up. So sometimes when I have had to set boundaries, I just end up being very firm and stern um, because I'm having a hard time just doing it when I want to show up with a little bit more humanity and a little bit more gentleness. Um, and I hope this process allows you to do this hard thing in a way that feels aligned with how you want to be. So please reflect on that, write it down if you want to. Here's my stuff. Um, these are the body feelings, feeling tense and tight, and this desire for me to ignore myself that those feelings don't matter and that the person on the other end of the line really needs help and I should ignore those feelings. So huge warning sign for me. Um, and then here's a, is an example of 
does this actually fit within my role? So a person calling and wanting to talk to me and only me. If we go back and look at what we described as my role as an advocate, it's blurry and gray. Uh, like I'm supposed to talk to people, but doesn't mean I'm supposed to answer everyone's call, the person who only wants to talk to me. Um, and then working through all of these feelings um, for why I don't want to hold this boundary up, why I just want to help when someone's asking for help and why should I say no? Um, saying no is going to further harm this person, they might self-harm, they might spiral. And I think an identity and ego thing is that they might not think of me as helpful. You know, just yesterday they said I was helpful and oh boy, did that feel good. Um, and now I'm going to have to have that part of my identity shift and think of myself as, as not helpful. And that's really distressing. Um, yeah. So I keep building my own tool over here. So a little bit I talked about why do I want to hold this boundary? Um, because I know what harm happens if I don't. I think a bunch of people have talked in the chat about without firm and clear boundaries, things get worse. Um, and I bring myself back, or I used to bring myself back when I worked in direct service and talked and reminded myself of like how much I cared about my fellow co coworkers and teammates and other people at my center. And that as much as I wanted to help this person, I knew that I was not gonna put my coworkers in a, in a bad situation like that. Oh, someone's in the chat. Yes, Casey says, we must break down the harmful assumption that boundaries are mean, kindness and compassion can be present while also setting boundary. Tone and delivery, oof, Casey, yeah, that's the thing. Um, and I'm really, you know, hoping that this reflection period for you to write your own tool lets you bring in that tone and delivery and kindness um, that I think sometimes is really hard to do because you're distressed, or at least I am when I do that. And so writing down the words a little bit of your values as an advocate and how you want to show up to the conversation. Um, for me, it's like, I want to be human and respectful and clear. And I want to give them a good reason why. I want to say that if I was on the other end of the phone, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I want to believe it myself. It's so hard for me to uphold things I don't believe in. I just know that about myself. Um, and then to be able to hold space for what it feels like to not get your needs met, that it feels unfair, that you know we say we're here to support survivors and you're a survivor and you're not getting supported right now. Um, and then lastly, I, I bring them, bring it back to in this space where I am not able to give them what they're asking for I can try to find somewhere else that can. You know, sometimes you can't, like we were talking about before. Sometimes we know that what they're asking for is not gonna happen. Um, and that's just more of that sitting with that frustration and unfairness. And I think, I think it was Adriana, maybe it was Kelsey, that talked about what it means to be on the helpline as, as a space of, of holding broken systems that people have anger, that they're not getting the help that they need, they're not getting justice. Um, and outside of sexual assault too, just like mental health systems, housing systems, income inequality, all of this stuff comes through and calls. And to hold that is, is like part of what comes with our job. Um, and that's a lot to hold. So next slide, oh, come on. Um, I talked about r literally writing out the phrases of what you would say to this person. So I did a little example here about what I would feel good saying to this person. Um, and I know for me, metaphor is what I like. Like metaphor is how I understand subjects, metaphors, 
when I use them, I feel like people understand me more. So this concept of the bridge and being a tender bridge, I think is really helpful for me in being like, this, this is not a place for you to stay. I can't keep supporting you here, but I can help you see what's on the other side. I can help you get to another side. I can help you choose the direction you want to go in. Um, and if you like metaphor, feel free to use the bridge, but feel free to use whatever you want. The seeing eye dog thing is really great. Um, we'll see what people are talking about in the chat. Yes, Casey, this, this piece about oppression and boundaries. I think that, uh, oh, let's just keep saying what people are saying. Whitney says, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, y'all should be running this webinar out here. Um, yeah, I think so much in our actual advocates of what it, why it feels so distressing to so many of us is because we're taught that we shouldn't have boundaries. Um, and that we should just be there for everyone all the time. And like Casey said, setting a boundary is being mean, being not helpful, being not a good person, not a good whatever you're supposed to be. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for bringing up that point. So this next piece is a little bit about how we align our personal boundaries. So we've like we've reviewed, we've reflected, we've assessed, we've tried to create our own tools on how we're gonna navigate this um, and how that connects to agency boundaries. So sometimes your personal boundaries are what you think should be done and might not be what your agency is deciding. And so what does it look like to try to align the two? Um, and so I hope that in your reflection you can see if there are places where they don't line up or they do, um, and try to have a conversation about that at your center. Um, this is a place for discussion. So if you want to go in the chat box or unmute yourself and talk about your agency guidelines and how you feel about them now and what does it look like to align the two, we can definitely talk about that now. So we'll leave a little space here. Um, I guess I'll unmute myself. Hey. Um, hi, everybody. It's so good to see you. So you probably can tell that boundaries is my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love talking about boundaries because I know how hard it is. And I think it's just really useful. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm really, really bummed that I joined so late. The, the link wasn't working for some of us. And I'm so glad it's being recorded because this is my favorite. Um, this is my favorite webinar that I think I've done the whole year. So thank you so much, Canyon. It's so important. Um, and I, I, I think I, you know, I've, already said the piece about working with youth but you know we have a really clear boundary at our organization I think most of us do about not providing transportation for folks right. where I've seen that I mean and I don't I don't want to provide transportation in most instance instances so having been a case manager way back when and having had to bring people to the grocery store and to their doctor's appointments and you know I, I know what, what comes with that. Um, however, when it comes to working with youth in schools, for me particularly, which I don't do very often, um, and also when I work with our amazing Jamie Ricker, our trafficking advocate, um, when I've had the opportunity to work with her, 
we've struggled with this. And when I've listened to her, and I, I think she, I hope she's still on this call. Um, you know, when I've had the opportunity to really hear the struggles from from cases and situations that she's gone through, gosh, it's that transportation piece. It's like, can't we just like bring this person down the street two miles? It just seems like sometimes so ridiculous. And yet there's a huge part of me that understands it and I respect it, but it, sometimes, my gosh, it's hard, so. <laughs> Thanks for that, Casey. Um, one of the pieces I've been thinking about is, you know, how different agencies respond to this question of boundaries. So uh, IRCM, I just heard, I think a couple weeks ago, like delivers food to people. Um, in a way that I don't think any other centers do or meet these kind of like basic needs. Um, and there's a question for me around when we're defining advocate role, do we need to broaden, even if we, you know, we hold the idea of, of boundaries, but do we need to like change how we're doing things? But that's, that's a bigger conversation. I'm going to shut myself up, maybe affinity conversation sometime. Um, I'm going to move on. So we're getting close to the end. This, this might be the, uh, yeah, well, this is the final slide. Um, if you've done some reflection and writing, I, I think at the top I, I asked, um, what are you looking to get out of this webinar? And bring yourself into the, into the space where you can put things aside so you can focus on getting something out of the webinar. Um, did you get it? If not, maybe we can talk about it now. Um, and then again, in your own reflection and tool building and integrating this into your work life, how are you going to do that? Um, where did you put your notes? Did you make a Word document? Where are you going to put that? Did you put it in a notebook? Was anything useful? How do you want to hold on to it? I keep thinking back to that piece about Maddie and, and the gift. It's like, I want to, I want to hold on to that. Um, and so where do you put that? Is it on your desk? Is it in, you know, your, your hospital bag that you have? So take a moment to think about that. And if folks want to share about their practices for that, please feel free. And if folks want to share about what they were looking to get out of the webinar, and if they got it or not, we'd love to hear about that too. And um, yeah, space for just discussion as well in the last couple minutes here. Thank you, Susan, I appreciate that. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Casey. Just because people are saying it's good doesn't mean you can't come in the chat and say, hey, I didn't get something too. So there's space for you. Thanks, Deanna. Thanks, Clara. Thanks, Whitney. This is, just a, this is just a thank you session out here. Um, one of the things I want to do before we go is I want to share this thing I saw another center do about ways of encapsulating knowledge in a workbook and that I find really cool. So let me pull this up here. Uh, mm -hmm. My Transformative Justice Workbook. Oh, I love it so much. Scroll down. Get to say who this workbook belongs to. There's the questions, there's the lines. So if you do want to come back to this webinar and create a tool if you didn't have time today, I love this format. Um, and I, 
I really believe that the more we create things that are pretty and nice to look at and that we actually drew ourselves or wrote down, the more we're going to want to use them instead of just a piece of paper or a word document. So if you find that useful, please do. All right, I think we're at the end of our time. Thanks, thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, I think being transparent about this stuff is so important. We got one more minute if people have questions or thoughts. Yeah, no one has questions or thoughts. It's time to go. The webinar is over. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and I will send out a link when it's all recorded. Bye, y'all.